Everything is tomatoes. The world is tomatoes. The water is tomatoes. Squished ones. And we're going on an adventure. The name Alpha Dream might not ring in many bells at first, but I'm sure you would recognize their talents by some of the games they've developed. That should be no surprise, since the company was founded in January of 2000 by various ex-members of Squaresoft. And sort of like how Squaresoft merged with Enix and now goes by Square Enix, Alpha Dream originally went by the name of Alpha Star. At one point, the studio was working on a game called Gimmick Land, which was originally being developed for the Game Boy Color. But Gimmick Land wasn't a half-finished prototype. It was basically complete, and sent to Nintendo for verification. But plans changed, and the Game Boy Color version was cancelled. According to an old interview, people at Nintendo were very impressed with Alpha Dream's work, and suggested that they let Nintendo themselves publish Gimmick Land but on the condition that they rebuild the game for the Game Boy Advance under the name Tomato Adventure. This final version would then be available in January of 2002, exclusively in Japan. And Nintendo must have been pretty satisfied with their work on Tomato Adventure, since Alpha Dream was granted the license to create Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, which inherited a lot of this game's DNA, and I don't mean the tomato -iness, nor the fact that they had a competition around launch where the winner earned one kilogram of tomatoes. If you're wondering how in the flying vegetables am I playing the unreleased Game Boy Color version, well, you can thank those cool Nintendo leaks from a while back. And if you're wondering how the game is in English, that's because it also got an English translation several days ago. This is what this video will be focusing on, while occasionally comparing the two instead of going balls deep. Because while it's interesting that we finally get to see this unreleased game, the comparison isn't as interesting as you might think. When I say that it has the same story and gameplay, I don't mean that they took the original ideas and restarted from scratch or reimagined it or anything. Tomato Adventure really is the same game, down to the letter. Obviously, it has updated graphics and sound to fit the Game Boy Advance, but the dialogue, the events, the gameplay mechanics, all of those are exactly the same, just redrawn to fit the specs of the new system. For the sake of simplicity, I'll be referring to the Game Boy Color prototype as Gimmick Land, and the final game as, well, Tomato Adventure. The story begins with a news report about a kingdom built by children, where ketchup is a way of life. With the help of the six super kids, King Abira brought about a new era for the land. Today is the tomato Tomatoversary, a holiday celebrating all things tomato. King Abira announces that they have completed the Super Kara Cooker, a machine that would let children remain children forever. We then move to the house of our unlikely protagonist, who is having some problems with his TV. After an explosive button-mashing session, he decides to go pay a visit to his mad inventor friend. This is Demil. He hates ketchup. And like everyone else who has not been enlightened by the properties of tomato sauce, he is what people refer to as a dropper. And all droppers are forced to live here in the spillage, a containment zone for the non-believers. Over in Salamo's house, Demil's inventor friend gives him a gimmick weapon, which is what people use to inflict pain in this world. He then goes over the mechanics in a short tutorial, and I'll get to that later. Outside, Demil's girlfriend, Pasaran, calls for and misses him in the most slapstick way possible. Some people say that droppers will be allowed to go outside during this holiday, and Pasaran is dead set on taking a trip to the toy ruin, even if it means beating the guard over the head with a yo-yo. And so, this epic, tomato-flavored adventure begins. Now, I'm sure that what I've just described is making you wonder if I'm right in the head or if I'm doped up on onions, but that's just the kind of game that Tomato Adventure is. 
It's obviously targeted at young children, but being a massive man-child myself, I still qualify as the target audience. Although, it seems that this was also one reason why the game never got released in the West. There's also a reason why I mentioned the Mario and Luigi RPGs. And that's because Tomato Adventure channels the same kind of silliness. It doesn't take Einstein to figure out that this game doesn't take itself very seriously. It stays a light-hearted comedy for most of its duration, and it will frequently break the fourth wall to point out the tropes and cliches in every ketchup-infused fever dream you find yourself in. Don't forget to save the game! And sometimes it's not even ketchup, but rather mayonnaise. The world is divided into multiple locations, each with their own people and their own... uniqueness. In the spillage, everyone is worried about being branded heretics for not liking tomatoes, but over in Mayonnaise, everyone is concerned with washing themselves in their mayonnaise, which apparently makes them more beautiful. Then in Namp Lagoon, everyone wants to be a rock star and they speak in rhymes. Then in Noistown, everything is made from candy, and you go around the place by... getting swallowed by giant snakes that love colored bananas? And it only gets sillier from there. You still have serious moments, and it doesn't take long until Passaran finds herself in another castle, but all of that is surrounded by a constant wave of silly. Though rest assured, one late game dungeon in particular gets quite trippy, to put it lightly. But my point is, it's everything that happens on the way there that elevates Tomato Adventure's story. It's about the journey, not the destination. Together with its colorful and strangely shaped cast of characters, Tomato Adventure is a game that is every bit as weird as it is charming. Some of that might be because here in my homeland the word tomatoes is also used as slang for testicles, but if there's one thing I'm an expert at, it's balls. Like I said, Gimmick Land and Tomato Adventure have the exact same story. The only meaningful difference is the inclusion of the Toma Trio, three colorful tomato guys who show up to give you advice. Tomaki, for example, frequently shows up on the Hanzo Labs scattered throughout the world, and these signposts, for example, have Tomagri racing about on them instead of only being a simple signpost. You can also see that the assets and everything is, like I said, pretty much just the gimmick land assets upgraded to Game Boy Advance standards. The spillage, for example, retains the exact same layout and house designs, just with more colors and a bigger size, thanks to the Game Boy Advance's increased resolution. Some small changes do exist, like the passageway on the gimmick palace, and the tomato chews sometimes looks like blood. The world map contains the same places, but it did get a makeover. Everything is a bit more squished to fit the Game Boy Color's aspect ratio, and the Hansel Bros's shacks are less fancy. As for the gameplay itself, it's a turn-based RPG, but with some... Uh, gimmicks that add an element of interactivity. The game has no random encounters, and instead battles are triggered by touching enemies walking around the maps. Demil is always present, along with one of three party members that you will meet during the story, each with their own stats, equipment and gimmick weapons. During each character's turn, you can run, you can use an item, or you can select a gimmick to attack with, and each one has its own unique, timed minigame. You don't have to get it right, but succeeding increases the damage it deals. Gimmicks are also separated into different groups that determine the sort of minigame it has, such as timing or speed, and each can be upgraded by using the correct items. However, gimmicks can only be used a certain number of times, and the only way to recover them is to spend the uses of all of your gimmicks. So if you spam your favorite all the time, you'll be unable to use it again for a while, incentivizing the player to try out all of them. Similarly, if you only use the strongest ones available, you'll also find yourself unable to use them for a bit. 
The most interesting part about it is how you can adjust the difficulty level of each gimmick. Lower difficulties are easier to handle but deal less damage, while higher difficulties deal more damage but are harder to handle. Increased difficulty also rewards you with the all bar filling more quickly. Once you fill it to a certain point, you can spend it to unleash some awesome attacks that deal tons of damage and have various useful effects. Keep in mind, however, that failing at a gimmick instantly resets this bar completely. It's an interesting self-regulating risk versus reward system. You get to use powerful attacks more frequently if you're really good at each minigame, but you're also punished hard if you ever fail at them. And yes, the entire system is present in Gimmick Land. The interface and menus have been restructured and squished a bit, but the gimmicks and stats are very similar, although I did notice that some scaled differently with the difficulty slider. The option to practice the minigames is also present. The backgrounds and enemy sprites have also been upgraded. Previously, backgrounds were mostly a flat white rectangle with some details on the top. Enemies were also limited to static sprites, rather than being animated like the party members. Anyway, I know I said that this is a turn-based RPG, but it's a kind of streamlined RPG in the same way that Mario & Luigi is. In fact, Superstar Saga shared a lot of the same ideas as Tomato Adventure, with its bigger emphasis on interaction and timing, and less on decision-making and preparation. Of course, unlike that game, there's nothing you can do when you're the one getting attacked here. Tomato Adventure only has interaction during your own attacks, it doesn't have counter-attacks. But I think you can see what I'm getting at. It's not in the same style as something like classic Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. I guess they're the kind of turn-based RPG that appeals to people that don't like turn-based RPGs. And again, just like the Mario and Luigi RPGs, this same level of interactivity is shown outside of battle, with enemies moving around all over the place and the player having to move appropriately in order to avoid them. There are also plenty of minigames and other things to deal with outside of battle, rather than simply walking from one place to the other. Sadly, while the story remains strong for the whole journey, the game's unique battle system starts dragging by the end. The balancing itself is mostly fine. Regular battles will rarely be a hurdle, but the boss battles are several steps above and can catch you off guard if you're not careful since they deploy different strategies that you must counter first before you can give them a proper beatdown. The problem is that playing the same gimmick minigames for every single attack gets very repetitive after a while. It slows things down when you know you can deal with non-boss battles easily enough that you don't need to succeed at the minigames to win. But you can't just mash buttons to get through them as fast as you can, since that won't fill your all meter. And speaking of gimmicks, there's a handful that go against the entire point of the combat system by being purely about luck. This is mostly a problem with the Eruptor gimmick, which you get early on and is total bollocks because you will have to use it at some point, and if you get unlucky you will have your all gauge reset through no real fault of your own. And while there are ways to increase a gimmick's number of uses, there are no items that let you restore them. Although, to be fair, you can only equip 4 gimmicks at once, so when you get at least 5, you'll be able to take it out. But that won't happen for a few hours, because while the first few hours are spent with only Demil and Alessa and a handful of gimmicks, once you reach Choice Town, you can get a whole bunch of new ones right away, and by the time you're done, you can easily have 3 times as many. The relative simplicity of the mechanics also resulted in an unbalance between party members, with Sotheby's massive HP easily making him more useful than the other two. Most individual gimmicks also don't specialize in anything particularly useful, besides Sotheby also having one that hits all enemies. Alessa has a bunch of gimmicks that inflict status effects, which is about as useless as you'd expect, 
Revic has very high speed, which might as well do nothing, and Sofbi and Demil themselves deal the most damage, which is enough to take down most regular enemies in one hit, and thus the most useful. But despite all that, I'm still going to recommend that you give the game a try, if you're looking for a fun and colorful RPG that doesn't take itself seriously. Sadly, despite being backed by a company as big as Nintendo, and despite the Mario and Luigi games being successful, things weren't going very well in the past few years for Alpha Dream. Profits had been slow, and incapable of keeping up with the increasingly high development and labor costs, and so they had no choice but to declare bankruptcy two years ago. And it's a shame, because they had such a good start back in the early 2000s, with both Superstar Saga and indeed Tomato Adventure, both being fine examples of the creativity and innocent charm that their games were filled with. <laughs>